A Very Special Hour with George Plimpton, presented by the DuPont Company. All eyes, please, over ring number three. And may we beg your... There are times when one wishes one hadn't requested confrontations of this sort. Trying to fly on the trapeze, playing a bad guy in a Western movie, gentlemen, please join us in welcoming... Or trying as an overnight comic to get a laugh out of a tough Las Vegas audience. And she said, yes, but have you seen the water lately? <laughs> and certainly one would have very serious doubts about becoming involved in this sort of confrontation. To become part of the violent profession of football. To throw oneself into a world where achievement and skill seem to run hand in hand with agony and frustration. Here in Ann Arbor, Michigan, a huge record-breaking crowd has turned up for a preseason game between the world champion Baltimore Colts and the Detroit Lions. And so far, they've seen quite a contest. It's the quarterback that most of them have kept their eyes on. For most of us, he is the central attraction. His eye and arm, his timing, his agility, his control and coolness under pressure. His is the position one daydreams about playing. And haven't we all felt that we have some, some hidden quarterbacking talents tucked away in us? Now playing quarterback for the Baltimore Colts is George Clifton. Well, I'm about to find out. After a month's training, the, the moment of truth has finally arrived. As one apprehensive but determined amateur disguised as a Colt attempts to enter the territory of 11 expectant lions. Blue! 23, set, six, six, the Great Quarterback Sneak is brought to you by... Sixteen. Hi, Gloria. We'll call you right back, okay? Six. Fifteen. Twenty-two. The cadence. The clear, confident rhythm of a quarterback's call to the center is perhaps the first and the most vital part of the successful play. Some years ago, I lost 35 yards as a quarterback with the Detroit Lions, due to, among other reasons, my somewhat indecisive and wavering calls at the line of scrimmage. A most humiliating episode, I must say. My name is George Plimpton, and at that time, I was on assignment for Sports Illustrated magazine to produce a report on what it's like to play against the pros. Now, for a film report, the world champion the Baltimore Colts have offered me the chance to try again perhaps even to regain those 35 yards in an exhibition game at halftime against the Detroit Lions. They're going to let me uh, try four plays as a quarterback. It's an opportunity which um, I look forward to in some respects, uh, but in others, well, <laughs> I'm not really quite so sure. The Baltimore Colts opened their training camp in mid-July at Western Maryland College, which is in the small rural community of Westminster. I arrived with a tennis racket. I, I had some sort of misbegotten idea that I have a chance to use it. Hey, you know, I'm fine. Good. You're in D32. That's three sections over the third floor. Thanks, Mom. How you doing? Thank you, sir. Clemson, George Clemson. Hey. There are very few of the amenities at the Colt camp. Very much the Spartan atmosphere. <laughs> Throughout the first morning with the physical examination, there was that same sense of the impersonal treatment, being herded about like cattle, that one remembers from an army induction camp. It was easy to tell the rookies, intimidated, rarely with anything to say. I was certainly intimidated, especially by the size of some of my fellow players. 
this down a little bit. After that, 192. And then again, like the army, the equipment never seemed to fit properly. My helmet was to cause unending anguish. I never could get the ears to set properly inside it. But then finally, with the first meeting that day, the team identities began to establish themselves. Don Nike, Italian, Syracuse. Ohio State University, offensive tackle. Uh, 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 <laughs> Don United's quarterback, the University of Louisville. Uh, pass offense and defense. As Coach McCafferty outlined the daily schedule, I found myself settled somewhat uneasily into a strange world with its new procedures and as in most professions, even a special language that could raise a laugh, though I had no idea why. Defense will uh, check the X and save the X. <laughs> the next morning it started. Practice in pads, full uniform, which meant that at some point during the day, the contact would begin. Pull yourself through behind your ankles, through your legs, through your legs, that's it. My own hope that first day was to try to blend in with the others, to achieve a sort of anonymity, hoping, uh, particularly with something as relatively simple as calisthenics, that I wouldn't do anything untoward that would uh, catch a coach's eye. High five push-ups, everybody hit it. Down, 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 down. It comes as a surprise that even in a professional training camp, with personnel who have been at the game a long time, it's always back to the basic fundamentals even how to fall on a football. With that ball and let it up in the air where somebody else can knock it out of his hand. Oh, no! You don't get it, you don't get it, do you? Yes, sir. Either right here, never here, or never here. Work them here. See that? It was a welcome time for me, those sessions on fundamentals, since my quarterbacking knowledge was somewhat limited. I'm sorry. Richard, get the cattle. <laughs> Almost everything one does on the practice field, though, is geared and works towards contact to that moment of confrontation when one breaks the other fellow down through brute force. The gauntlet is one of the contact drills, one of the mildest. Come on, Clinton, shake it up. Get up, George. <laughs> they let me off easy that first time, but not so in what came up next, the so-called Oklahoma drills a fiendish exercise invented by Bud Wilkinson when he coached the Oklahoma Sooners. The Oklahoma drill involves two linemen and a running back who takes a handoff and tries to follow his blocking between two tackling dummies. It's a bruising exercise, and one that quarterbacks, being delicate specialists, at least in my case, aren't supposed to try. But I couldn't resist it. My first attempt at the Oklahoma was so tentative, sort of like tiptoeing up to a fence, that I asked to try it again. I should have known better. I ended up with a dislocated thumb, and what's more, it was on my throwing hand. Broke. It's broken? Nope. No. <laughs> yeah, how the hell am I going to throw this thing? And that was the somewhat humiliating finale of that first morning of practice, ending up as the first casualty of the okay, season. Man, up the hill. Hey, hey. At midday, the schedule allows for three hours to lick one's wounds and rest up before the afternoon session. Then it's back into the training room, in a sense, the social center of a football team. By necessity, players spend a lot of time here, being treated, tending to themselves, and for the twice daily procedure of being taped. It's a hundred dollar fine at Baltimore if they catch you on the practice field without taped ankles. Some 30 miles of it are used up in the course of a season. Okay, man, let's go. The afternoon session starts with another team meeting. 
The films were back from that morning's Oklahoma drill. The performance of the participants run back and forth, studied, evaluated, and criticized. No leg drive. You're not coming off at the snap. Somehow, my first attempt sneaked onto the reel. That's the last time, Coach. Hey, Earl, how's it going? How about? That afternoon, my bad thumb and the bandaged hand did not exactly enhance my attempts to blend into the background, nor did it do much for my quarterbacking skills. Blue! Sorry. Blue! I'm sorry. Oh. Hut. All right, show him, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Now and then I was able to get advice from such great players as John Unitas. That was always helpful, but obviously they couldn't afford to spend much time on me. Blue. All right, call the formation and the play, and go to the hand. Let's call two of the. Fortunately, I had a friend who could concentrate on me. John Gordy, an ex-Detroit Lion, who could give me the individual yeah, coaching I needed so desperately. This, the, the, the back is not going to, he's going to come straight from his position. Back carrying the ball is going to take the ball on the same side he's going to, of the hole. Yeah, right. So if it's the 24, it's going to be over there. I've got to turn like this and hand it to him like this, right? Right. OK, 24, dive on one. Green, 23, set. Hunt. Don't be afraid. Kick him in the ass and move him over there. Everywhere on the field, at different levels of intensity, similar coaching was going on. What is he going to do to you if you lay on him like that? He's going to be around you, right? Come on, learn. I was always conscious of the scrutiny, the eyes watching, the coaches. There wasn't a move made that wasn't observed and cataloged. And then the rookies watching, constantly evaluating their chances. Checking the veterans to see if they could pick up some trick, some move that would be useful. And then the veterans, rather more contemplative perhaps, but still acutely aware of the activity out on the field. Always an eye out for the competition, rookies coming up, pressing them for their jobs. John, do you get much help from the, uh, from the veterans being a rookie? Well, I'm getting more and more. I'm uh, not so much afraid to ask for it now. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's it's kind of a bad feeling when you don't know what's going on. Yeah, so you have to ask. Yeah. You, you find that they're jealous of their positions, and or do they no. really give you all they can? I think they're kind of secure, and they <laughs> don't mind helping me. Don Nottingham was the last rookie of the NFL draft, picked 441st, but actually a player who would eventually make the team. Well, so maybe I can pick this game up after all. <laughs> there were always veterans who made a point of trying to help the rookies as much as they could. Bill Curry, the first string center. It's the hard thing to break. The sequel is in the hands. So he's trying to beat you one way or the other. You actually regain your own balance by punching him. It's perfectly legal. You're allowed that. It's here, whichever side he's trying to beat you, you get your balance back here. Back over here, you keep your nose about the height of his numbers. And then finally that afternoon, the last drills of the day, what are called the gassers, running the width of the field back and forth. The first string quarterback, gimpy from an Achilles heel operation, followed by the last string quarterback, just plain tuck it out. This may actually be the best part of the day. It's after supper before we, we go to the classroom and the, the day of uh, violence is, is over. And I, and I must say, I don't, I don't like the uh, violence. I'm not equipped for it uh, either mentally or nor is my body. But I'm gonna continue it because it does puzzle me, a fascinating puzzle, uh, and I intend to, <laughs> to uh, persevere. At least I hope I can.
500 miles to the north, under the watchful eye of head coach Joe Schmidt, the Detroit Lions were well into their preseason training. In two weeks, they'd be confronting us in Ann Arbor. John Gordy, my tutor, went up there to see what he could find out about them. All right, stay up, stay up, stay up. All right. How do you feel about George uh, playing four players against uh, against your team? If George, you know, wants to play, that's up to him. Uh, uh, we'll give him uh, a good day's work up there at Ann Arbor, and uh, uh, we'll get after him just like we would any other quarterback. If you got any advice, I can take back to him. Well, uh, the only advice I could give is that uh, I hope he's in good shape and is able to run. Detroit has always been famous for its defenses, particularly its front four defensive linemen. None has a greater reputation than number 71, the all-pro Alex Karras. He is short in stature for a lineman and doesn't see very well. But his teammates say of his quick, distinctive moves on the football field that he runs like a mad duck. When I'd played briefly with Detroit, it was always a comfort to think of him as a teammate. It was quite another matter to think of him as an opponent. I have a real thing going against quarterbacks, and I, li I enjoy uh, knocking them down and making them look funny. Want to hurt them? I don't think I want to hurt them as much as uh, just embarrassing them. I, it's because of my background, and because I, just, I feel that they're all together different than I am. And, uh, and I hate to say they're sissies, but that's just about what I think about. How do you then feel about playing against George? George is, uh, I'm sure, had recitals when he was a child. I've seen him play the piano, and I know he must have been on many, many picnics with his mother and father, so I'm not going to have that much problem getting up to play against a guy like George Plimpton, uh, although we're good friends off the field. Of course, my whole life has been football. I'm a very violent guy on a football field, so that's not going to interfere at all just because I know him, just because my son's named after him. Uh, George Plimpton to me, if I can get a piece of him, I'm going to. And uh, <laughs> I don't know if I want to maim him, but... 34, wham, trap, hut. The great paradox of football is that the violence, the brawn, is coupled with so much brain work, and that really far more of the professional football player's time is taken up with study and classroom work. This is our interception ball. If they throw that old cut on us, they're throwing it to the strength of our combination defense. We'll just let the linebacker go. Of course, that arcane language, all those circles and crosses and arrows, ultimately have to be translated into action down on the field. He makes it easy for himself. I had 10 or 12 players to work from, of which a final choice of four would be made to throw against Detroit. The most complex of them was a bootleg play, which to be able to repeat in the huddle was like memorizing a difficult poem. Think right, split, fake, 39, flow, bootleg, right, off end, come back, 18. Ready? The way, check. On one. Ready? Black. 23. Set. It's a peaceful enough pursuit, working out plays and theory and running patterns on the practice field. You're kidding. But finally, one has to commit them to action, to the physical violence that essentially is what football is all about. The evidence was always there of the toll that playing the game took, and how much effort and discipline halfback Tom Matty, having lost a year through injury, must go through to get back to the field. Your mental toughness is doing things you don't like to do. That's when you have to do them, you know you have to do them. It's just like pushing this thread around here. I've got to do it or my legs won't get in shape. I don't want to do it. But mentally and physically, I have to. So you just listen to what these trainers had to say. And you come out in the long run a lot better off if you try to do it on your own. If I end up with one injury, it's going to be a squashed ear, John. Or you'll be lucky. Looking back over 11 years, George, I twisted my Achilles, three ligaments and one cartilage, uh, full growing, which you play with anyway, uh, full muscles, two hip pointers, uh, two broken ribs, and two ribs where the cartilage was uh, torn off the bone, uh, an elbow operation, um, <laughs> the neck brace, the um, uh, six concussions, <laughs> 10 stitches here, five here, and 10 here, four teeth out, <laughs> and uh, um, I, that's about it. You just keep it. <laughs> there is so much pain, so much time spent in repair, 
And indeed, perhaps it was because of my own ravaged thumb that I really had to question the fundamental need for it all. Bill Curry, for one, the veteran's center. Do you, do you enjoy uh, smacking somebody? Well, there's an old line that Duffy Doherty is supposed to have coined, uh, George, that football is not a contact sport. Dancing's a contact sport. <laughs> football is a collision sport. And I suppose that uh, it sort of goes along with one's basic philosophy. I think that man is by nature a violent creature, and anybody who's read history can, yeah. can see that that's true. And to overcome an opponent, surely there's a satisfaction there. And that's, that's I think, the basis for being a, a lineman in football. I think that it serves the same purpose for our society in that people can vicariously experience the violence of 22 people on a field in a controlled situation with rules so that uh, it's a very healthy and a very human thing. Well, to be honest, I like to think of myself as a gentle person, but uh, I am violent, yeah. You couldn't be a, a lineman in pro football and not be violent. Um, I enjoy the collisions and the contact, uh, maybe a little more than I'd like to admit. And I think it's a basic tendency that no good... Can Bill Lasky happen. plays linebacker for the Colts, a I roving defensive position which has particularly destructive wrong, tactics. Sure what I do. Bill, the, the clothesline, I guess you, you literally try to knock someone's head off, don't you? But I suppose it actually did come off and was rolling there on the ground. What would your emotions be? Well, you, <laughs> some, some people may feel bad. Uh, personally, I, uh, I really, if it was a clean shot and it was a legal uh, hit, I really uh, wouldn't feel that bad about yeah. it uh, deep down inside because uh, uh, I know that it's part of the game and so does the other fellow. This is the reason we're out there. Yeah. It's, a, it's a controlled, violent game. And this is all part of it. And uh, I know that uh, I'm going to give my shots, and in turn, I'm also going to get hit. I didn't consciously think about it until I got in college. But uh, actually, what football became for me, when I once learned to vent this uh, violence or aggressiveness or whatever you want to mm -hmm. call it on the field, that it was a great help to my, my personality, that this mm. was a constructive outlet. I could be a part of a unit, and we could work toward a goal, as Bill mentioned. And uh, I didn't have to assert myself off the field. Mm. And I, it really has uh, helped me a great deal. What is the high point of that week? I kept um, after it, trying to resolve what the pleasures the were. Is it the game From Dan Sullivan, who's been playing game, offensive guard for 10 years. Excitement getting ready for it? Uh, no, measure I, 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 would th I think it's the game itself yeah. uh, is, is the big thing. Because you, you, it's, it's not like baseball or hockey or, or basketball or some of the other professional sports that that they play two or three nights a, a week or three nights a week or, or more than that. Even They don't really have that much time in preparation for each game. I know I'm starting to think of Alex Karras right after the last game I just played. If I have to play Karras this week, I was thinking about him Sunday night. You know, you don't have you know time for one beer after a game, and that's about it. You start thinking about someone else. And uh, you've, you're anticipating the things that he's going to do to you and, and the things that, that you know are on your plans for the week. And, and when you execute those things and they come out well at the end, uh, you have a great satisfaction. How many and times have you to... actually, in, the, in those 10 years, have you actually handled or touched the ball? Oh. <laughs> I don't know. I think I fell on a fumble one game. I guess once, that's about it. Yeah. Once in 10 yeah. years. John, is there a part of the game that begins to pall after these, the number of years that you've played it? Or is, can you still bring that enthusiasm and dedication oh. to it? Well, I love the game. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't play the game if you didn't enjoy playing it, you know. And um, I, as far as enthusiasm is concerned, uh, I haven't lost it. Uh -huh. I guess when I lose that, then I'll quit. John Mackey is the team's tight end, probably the best who ever played that you position. You push yourself as hard. Intense, and competitive, a team leader. John, how do you prepare for a game? Now I know what's good for me, yeah. and basically what's good for me is that I don't eat anything after 9 o'clock on Saturday night, other than maybe a glass of juice or something before I go to bed. And by 2 o'clock on Sunday, I am a crazy man, and I'm angry, and um, I play better football. How do you get yourself angry? Well, I'm hungry. <laughs> it's automatic. When it's my, automatic. my mood always changes when I'm hungry. Oh. That's a good thing to remember, isn't it? I, I think the opposition might uh, slip you a hot dog or something before the game. Yeah, mm -hmm. they can. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
It isn't food or the lack of it that the great defensive end Bubba Smith thinks about before a game. He gets himself hyped up with music. He carries a cassette player with him right up to the moment he goes on the field. I just... What sort of music is, the, is it particularly that would get you uh, ready for a game? Well, usually it's the, the Motown-type music, you know, music that jumps, that helps me to, you know, to perk up. Yeah. Prior to going to the stadium and I'll just sit in my den, turn on my stereo and listen for a while. And before long, 10 or 15 minutes later, you know, I'm ready to kill somebody. You know, I really want to play then. Hey, it's beginning to rain a little bit. Practice goes on, though, nonetheless, isn't it? Oh, it could snow out there and we'd still be practicing. <laughs> what is it that you that you love about football best, Bubba? The thing that I love about football best is the fact that that's all I know. <laughs> <laughs> what about the other side of the coin? The part of football that I don't like is the part that I'm going through now. That's training camp, yeah, yeah. because you're isolated. It's a big nothing town, nothing to do. You go to practice, you come back, you go to practice, you come back, you in meetings, practice, yeah. sleep. Meeting, practice, sleep. That's all you ever do. There is one day during training camp when that dull regimen is broken. Big barbecue feast on the outskirts of town. <laughs> It's followed by what is a ritual in almost all the NFL camps, the rookie show. It's a night of beer, both consumed and thrown. How's the game going, Goop? It's a theatrical extravaganza for the coaches and veterans put on by the rookies themselves. Theatrical talent may be limited, but the Rookie Night is an annual private ritual that does much to create the sense of camaraderie and togetherness that is so important a characteristic of a championship team. There's Don McCafferty. The uh, easy rider, they call him here. It was a strong bond between all of us that night, and it was good to be a part of it. Keep coming, Doc. Keep coming. Turn it on, Doc. Come on, Doc. All right, back. Come on, Doc. Come on, Doc. Come Six flat. Day by day, the drills went on, and they put me in as often as they could. Despite my bad thumb, I took my turn in the passing drills. We had a live scrimmage coming up in a day or so when I would put my plays to the test. And I needed all the practice and help I could get. Blue. 13. Set. Hook. Oh, that's perfect. That's got to be. Yeah, that's, that's the way it's got to be. Your hand off me. And of course, John Gordy kept after me, drilling me over and over. Inevitably, I kept glancing over at John United, as if I could pick up his quarterbacking skills by osmosis. Sidelined by an injury, he kept to himself, but practicing endlessly. In the NFL, two or three players are known as the main man. Number 19, Unitas, is one of them. An unknown from the sandlots of Pittsburgh who became football's greatest quarterback. His presence on the field simply lifts a team, not only by his physical skills, but through his capacity for authority. You can't believe him what he's called is going to be any good. But if you get in there and you come right out and say, P36 trap one, two, bang, get out of the huddle. Even if the play doesn't work, I mean, it, it's, it's, the defense might be stacked against it because you called it with such authority. Yeah. So they're going to go out and make it work. Yeah. Well, I've got to do this scrimmage on Saturday. When do you think I should keep really foremost in, in my mind? Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, now that we've gotten rid of that. <laughs> 
John, you're a winner. How do you feel when you lose? I don't really feel hurt that we lost. I get disgusted with myself because I played, I didn't call the game properly, or I had a bad day throwing the football. And this is the only thing that disgusts me. I don't get mad at, at anybody outside of myself, particularly. Because I just felt that if I do my job and I call the game right, if I put the ball where it's supposed to, we're going to win. No one's going to beat us. Well, in talking yeah, about I quarterbacking, there, there perhaps the court player I was closer to was halfback Tom Matty. He'd been thrown into quarterbacking with an abruptness quite like my own. In 1965, he was suddenly handed the job after injuries to both Unitas and Quasar. A complete novice, he caught the fancy of the country as he came within a hair's breadth of taking the Colts to the championship. I think I had more fun at that position than I've ever had in football because the players rallied behind me. They knew how inadequate I was at playing the quarterback position. What was it like that first time up, Tom? Well, we had to prepare against the Los Angeles Rams, who at that time had the fearsome foursome. And uh, uh, a good story I used to tell about it was when I first came up to the line of scrimmage, you know, you're under that center a little bit, and, and you're bending those knees, getting down in a crouch position and everything. And when I came up and they were bent over in their stance, I still couldn't see their defensive backs. They were that big because they were all about 6'6", six, 6'8", six, six, and about 260, 270, 280. And half of them could run faster than I could, which scares you a little bit. So you're looking right into the, right above the right face into bars. The, yeah, right into these guys' eyes, you know, and they growling and snorting at you a little bit, like the uh, cattle do, as we call them. Did you find that your character changed being a quarterback? No, I was still uh, the jovial type of little fat halfback, they call me. And there was more levity. There was more of a relaxed feeling around our ball club at that particular time than any time that we've mm. ever played, I think. When you're a quarterback, you're going to have a little nervousness in you. Try to just relax. Get that ball in under control. And uh, after you get hit that first time, it's all over, and you're going to you're gonna be just one of the guys then. Yeah. And uh, I think that the only thing I can say is just go out there, enjoy yourself. Mm, yeah. Well, area block the backside. A good live scrimmage would indicate how much enjoyment I could get out of quarterbacking. And the day of it came all too soon. And it might even be uh, one of the plays that uh, George Plimpton will run with our team when he's in there on, uh, on a scrimmage. Thank you. I understand you're going to run a few plays today. Yeah, you're going to run about three of them, I think. <laughs> Mike Curtis was the middle linebacker I'd be going up against shortly. The animal, they called him, and it was not easy to forget his Cheshire cat grin as we went down the hill for my big afternoon. The news of a live scrimmage brings the crowds out, and there was a fresh sense of excitement and anticipation. My time would come at the last three plays of the day. Okay, George, you ready? At the end of the practice, my moment came. Three plays. Call whatever you want. George. Okay, we go. Blank. Watch right. it, you're going to get run over right there. Come on, Curry. Ride 38, sucker on one. Hey, ho, ho! All right. Watch out for a run. Clemson can move. Elon. Watch it. Hold up, right here. 15. Set. Hut. The ball was knocked out of my hands by my own guard, pulling the block, and we'd gone backwards 10 yards. Double wing right, split, 68 CI on one. Ready? The pass play, a quick look into the split end. Come on, George! I shuck him inside, right? 23! Boy, the exhilaration of that, only slightly tempered by knowing my last call was the quarterback sneak and that hands were going to be laid on and finally I'd be blooded. Watch out. I'm alive. <laughs> oh. All right, good workout. No specialty. Dinner at 5 30. Up the hill. It was pretty good natured, all of that, and easy enough to get through, but it crossed my mind it wasn't going to be at all the same against Detroit. 
Still, at the time, it seemed a pretty fine ending to an afternoon, despite the daily agony of my helmet. <laughs> Our receiver doesn't have it out there. Our Having checked me out in the scrimmage, Coach McCafferty selected the four plays I'd use against the Detroit Lions. Right or left? Right or left? Right or left? Right, the fourth play, and, and we were talking about a possibility of bootleg, but uh, after time you're in the 40, uh, there's no way you're going to get around that end. You, no matter who you fool, they'll, they'll catch up with you. So we'll settle on a, uh, a quarterback draw. Uh, both the center and left guard will step back one step and center blocks left, left guard will pull and trap Karras. We saved the fourth one the last, yeah. for the reason I told you before. Uh -huh. If you run in the first play, uh, you might not be around for the other three. <laughs> What's good to hear, Coach. <laughs> <laughs> good luck. <laughs> With the Detroit game just two days away, it wasn't easy to stick to one's room with that on one's mind, and most of the Colts would collect at a nearby pizza palace. But of course, the talk never strayed very far from football. What about getting, psyching oneself up for a game? Does everybody have more or less the same rituals, or are they completely different? What do you do, Boo? I drink a few beers before I go to, go to bed, and I just relax and try to really stay relaxed and try not to think about the game as much so I don't get real nervous and don't get hurt. Well, like Alex Karras goes uh, hitting lockers before the game or something. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, he usually, he usually vomits before a game. You know, from the standpoint of uh, weakness, vomiting wouldn't have any effect on you during the game because, uh, you know, it takes four hours for food to get into your system anyhow to provide energy. So anything that's on your stomach before the game is just extraneous. You really don't need that weight. So I guess technically that could be helpful. I did it once, but I didn't, I didn't enjoy it, so I, haven't, I managed to control it. Still, however much I learned, what lay ahead for me was an absolute uncertainty. I could run through those four plays in my mind and imagine marvelous things happening on the field. Set. Handoffs that would spring her back loose for a long game. Or that pass play of mine, dropping back and connecting with my receiver with deadly accuracy. I could even consider the possibility of my quarterback draw working, catching the defense off balance, bursting through and running clear with nothing but green in front of me. But then, too, it was just as easy to have the nightmares in my mind, nibbling at my confidence. Quarterback draw stopped at the line. The ignominy of having my pass intercepted. The infinite variety of disasters that could occur. Scenes of such humiliation that I wondered how on earth I'd put myself in a position where in Ann Arbor, against the Lions, such things could happen to me. Plimpton, the great quarterback sneak, is being brought to you by... Ann Arbor, Michigan, on a very hot Sunday. Game time just two hours off. the game, I know it's, you know, it's going to be extremely hot out there, and, and I know I got to, this tackle I have to face, I have to go all out, you know, to get by About mid-season last year, I could line up in front of a guy and look across the line at him and hate him. I mean, and, you know, like physically, try to really, you know, take his head off and uh, not feel anything. Worse for that, you know, I didn't, I couldn't do that, and uh, it reflected in my play. Hey, Earl, how's it going? Security guard, go to gate 21. Security guard, gate 21. 
on color. Ready? Hey. Now I'm trying to hold back and save the energy since it's such a hot day. I'm trying to hold back now. Any nervous energy I might have because I'll need it on the field. I, uh, I'm always afraid that I'll miss an assignment or something that'll lose the game or something like that. And I don't want to ever do that. It's I'd... humiliation, isn't it, which is the big thing that one wants to avoid? Well, it's letting your teammates down. You know, they're expecting you to break your ass out there. And uh, so you got to do it for them. I mean, for yourself, of course. But just don't get nervous, George. Four plays, they can't get to you. Don't worry about it. If they do, just fall on the ground. Be all right. That's great. My confrontation was almost at hand. Yet at the beginning, there was a sort of jaunty security in knowing there was a cushion of almost 30 minutes of play before my involvement. I tried to take an interest in the game. The Colts, with ill moral quarterbacking, did well at the start. Perhaps when the time came, their success would be infectious, and I could latch on to their momentum. I watched the Detroit defenses trying to imagine how my four plays would work against their defensive sets. But then finding myself lost in contemplation of how, how fast and brutal and furious the action was. Kara seemed to be having an especially good game. The chances of trapping him in my first play suddenly seemed so remote. But I kept rehearsing it. Blank right split, dive 38 sucker on one trying to set the play firmly in my mind so that no amount of pressure could unsettle me. Time began to move in great gulps. I kept wishing it would move forward one full hour so that whatever happened, however disastrous, it would be safely in the past. On the bench, in that strange atmosphere of urgency and confusion, there was very little communication. My teammates, faces by now so familiar to me, seemed locked into their private worlds. I kept glancing up at the clock and at Coach McCafferty. Ladies and gentlemen, now playing quarterback for the Baltimore Colts in a short series of special plays is George Plimpton. The crowd noise rose to an almost unbearable pitch. And my last thought before I stepped into the huddle was that I was getting the same anticipatory reaction the Christians must have heard when they stepped out to meet the Lions of their day. Plank right, ride 38 sucker on one. Ready? Come on, Alex. Scream him, Alex. Come on, Terry. The first play, a simple handoff. Everything looked right. But suddenly, Kara shifted, filling the hole where my ball carrier was to go. I had no way of changing the play. Move. 23, and you're right, set, cut. Nearly fumbling in my anxiety, I had no choice but to send Nottingham to his doom. But then this. A penalty flag went down. Personal foul. You got flag, keep one out of your pocket, you fun. Uh. Detroit raised a big fuss. But clearly, it was a correct call. Something certainly hit me. So there it was, a 15-yard penalty. 
It wasn't my idea of how to pick up yardage, but perhaps the next play, which was supposed to blow through Karras, would be run with more style. Oh, come on, let's move it now. Okay, flank right split, 34 wham on one. Ready? almost nowhere, just a hard yard or so. The only thing was to forget it, to dismiss the failure and to regroup again. We had the pass play coming up. Double wing, right, split, 68 CI on one. Ready? <laughs> came up out of the crush. The ball was deflected. Beyond, I could see the receiver in the clear. Damn it. What? The humiliation began to set in, what so many athletes pray they can avoid. Blank right split. Quarterback 52, trap draw on one. Come on, George. I had only one last hope to vindicate myself with the final play, the quarterback draw. before Karras got me. But with that play, I really had a great chance. The blocking had been fantastic. If only I'd been quicker. For an instant, there had been just green in front of me. Are you hurt? No. Thank you. The crowd was, was sympathetic enough, and really I suspect they were, they were comforted by my difficulty. It was in the proper order of things that the amateur fare badly in that company. Still, the, the walk to the locker room was an awfully long one. Thank you, Coach. Good work. That way, Alex. Really got it. Well, the team has gone down to start the second half. Uh, I'm obviously not very pleased with what went on down there. I mean, I had a four chances, and it's sort of a mockery, really, to have spent so long, almost a month, getting ready for that one minute of play and to have things go wrong like that. I always remember that hand coming up and knocking down the pass. It seemed to be going right for the receiver. Quarterback sneak worked. If I would have been better if I'd managed to stay on my feet because they blew right past the center. I could have worked better. So all in all, that's really a disappointment, I guess, all of it, except that I survived. And of course, it's over. But the really great compensation, and I felt this terribly strongly in the huddle, was that you've up there, and there are all these people that you've gotten to know. And there are faces that you can recognize, even behind the bars of the helmet. Sullivan, and Curry, Rentzler, and the others, all looking at you and expecting you to tell them how to perform, or tell them to perform. And that, uh, and remembering what, uh, how they did try and what friends they are is certainly compensation enough. The Baltimore Colts had a difficult time in the second half. The rookies being tested for the first time showed their inexperience. The Detroit offense began to move. The mood on the Baltimore bench matched my own. Ernest Hemingway once said that it was a mistake to get to know athletes too well because eventually one was forced to suffer defeat with them, and it was a considerable strain on one's sense of well-being. I began to understand that. So the Lions had their day. The Colts would have theirs soon enough. In the meantime, one had had the experience, and the time would come when I could think back on it and relish the best parts of that brief personal expedition into football's complex world, which combined so many opposites, humiliation and success violence and camaraderie, skill and error, confusion and teamwork. And out of it all, there were things to be remembered. Having left on the football field whatever inclinations I might have had for violence and brute force, 
I find myself now here in Kenya, East Africa, where I hope to do less running than walking. I'm here as an amateur in the exciting profession of wildlife photography, here on a special assignment for Life magazine. The story will take me to the mists of Marsabit Mountain on the northern frontier, where I am to find and bring back a picture story of what is probably the largest land mammal in the world, a legendary elephant named Ahmed. Seldom seen and rarely photographed, the monster of Marsabit would lead me on a long and not so merry chase before our first confrontation. I hope you'll join us on our next adventure. <laughs>